White Centipede Noise podcast is made possible by your support via Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash white centipede noise to support and stay tuned to hear about the exclusive benefits and bonus content available with this episode. to White Centipede Noise Podcast. I'm Oscar Brummel, and today my guest is Kevin Novak of TEF, one of the masters of cut-up harsh noise, representing Texas. TEF is a personal favorite artist of mine, and his recent album, Rot, was one of my top 10 noise releases of 2022. TEF will also be on an East Coast and Midwest tour this July with a large group of other Texas artists, so be sure to check them out in a city near you. Hey, Kevin. Welcome to White Centipede Noise Podcast. How's it going? Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. Um, you're someone I've wanted to talk to for quite a while. Big fan of your work and a lot of people on the podcast or lots of f- viewers of the podcast have been asking about getting you on. So really, really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Cool. Um, I think I'd like to just start with kind of the, maybe the ubiquitous question that I ask a lot of people. And it's kind of a common question when you talk to people who are into noise is how, how did you initially get into noise and then how did that initial discovery come to kind of making such a specific style of noise that you make because you know you're for for those who aren't fully aware of what you do you know you're like harsh noise cut up master and it's really really technical fast complex you know in the style i mean I wouldn't say you're in the style of anyone, but in the direction of like a lot of the the Japanese artists, but with a, you know, American edge. And that's a very hyper specific, you know, thing to go into. And it also requires a ton of skill. It's not just like, Oh, pick up some, pick up a guitar or pick up a contact mic and make some racket. Like that requires a lot of, there's a lot of craft that goes into it. So where did you get into noise in the first place? And how did that kind of lead to where you are now? Oh, uh, yeah, so I guess like back in the 80s, and so I was into like metal, you know, from from that period, 70s and 80s. And uh, of course, I was, uh, you know, small rural community, so I wasn't really exposed to a, a lot of weird music growing up say like punk rock and and, um other stuff it wasn't until i went started going to college after graduating that that i met people you know from the houston area and uh uh, other people who had like more varied say uh backgrounds and different music so uh, Mm um me with metal, I'd always been interested in, in like some of the more unusual sort of things that were going on with some bands. Um, and which then, bands, for example, are you kind of into like which which kind of flavor of metal? Oh, uh, like so in particular, I, I've I've always liked Judas Priest. Mm-hmm. If you listen to some of those solos, they get really sort of weird sometimes with a lot of effects. Yeah. Um, so so that was one. Uh even when I was like younger, I, I, I always had like a I always loved like uh Hendrix's Star Spangled Banner. Yeah. Just like break down the middle, which was like, you know, pretty much noise in and of itself. Yeah. So, but yeah, after I got graduated from high school, going to college, I, I just started like searching for just 
different genres of music and uh someone like turned me on to skinny puppy mm-hmm. immediately went out and got got two of the their tapes and was hooked because it was like just you know it, it sort of had that same extremity but it was just you know um completely different approach yeah uh, and, and and weird and um you know that then i'm looking for more stuff like that because it there wasn't a lot around at the time that that had uh you know that that sort of like experimental edge to it right well in the industrial scene it was a lot of it was just pretty much you know more straightforward you know beats and you know mm-hmm. ground vocals and stuff uh, yeah. so in searching for you know more experimental stuff within that genre it kind of led me into uh um uh, trying to, to to think uh uh, like uh, eventually, you know, I, I found out about Neubaut and mm-hmm. uh, SPK. I never got into Throbbing Gristle like, like so many other people did. I mean, I tried, and there were only a, a few albums that uh, and tracks that that I really kind of clicked with at, at that time. What was it that kind of put you off them? Uh, maybe the production values. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, which, which I guess would, would, I mean, that it was for, from like the seventies and a lot of it is like really, really lo-fi. And I, I've just, that's never, that's a sound that's never really appealed to me. I can see All that. Right. Cause, I, Cause like, yeah, like skinny puppy, I can see the trend. I can see the relation between like the metal thing for you and skinny puppy and what you do because skinny puppy is still very robotic and like, sequence and in, in program but also very dark and like distorted and and, and fucked up but but but, but Robin Gristle is pretty loose and like wobbly and like you know jammy kind of it's like almost jam kind of stuff sometimes yeah because I, I even back in the uh late 80s early 90s before I even started getting into noise I'd comment to people about skate puppy it's like I'd listen to like an album and it's like I'd know all the songs, but then I'd listen to it again and always find like something new mm-hmm. in the tracks that I hadn't heard before. Yeah, so so cool. there's just a lot going on with, within, the, within the music. And, and you'd have to, you'd really have to like listen to it to hear it all. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I said, of course, you know, got into Noy Bouton and, uh, certain period of, of like SPK um, uh, I'm trying to think because it's like that's been you know 35 years or, or more sure uh, where, where did you get yeah. the Trump the jump from that kind of industrial to that kind of pure harsh noise mm. um Well, okay. Houston at the time, you know, uh, they had, there were two college radio stations, which I'd also, I was listening to in the, in the late eighties and there were, um, you know, various programs, um, that would play a variety of, you know, weird stuff as well. So, so even while I was, you know, uh, trying trying to find this stuff myself, I'm hearing it, you know, on on the radio. Um, I mean, I it's kind of like already sort of like gravitating towards, say, uh, you know, so, some of the um, I guess the French integrum acts from the time, you know, the tape music, mm-hmm. 
that that was uh, appealing to to me from that time. So um, yeah. When did so, you yeah. start? When did there you was start? Like a, Sorry, go ahead. Go on. Overlap uh, uh, with various things uh, uh, during that time in the late '80s, early '90s. Um, but as far as like going from that to noise. Uh, I just randomly one day picked up a used copy of uh, The Haters in the Shade of Fire uh, at a record shop in Houston. No idea what it was. I was just like, I want to get, you know, I I have like, I think I had a few dollars in credit at the store for some some trade-ins I had done. Mm -hmm. And I'm just looking for something, you know, find something unusual that, that, that this, you know, store credit will cover and it was a used copy and I just picked it up, took it home, put it on. And I was like, yeah, I'm digging this <laughs> and ended up making a tape copy and playing it. Like just putting it in, uh, like when I'm driving around and let it loop. Did, did that hook you? Like, were you, were you then like, I need more of this kind of stuff? Uh, actually it, I liked it, but, um, it did, at the time, it didn't really, I guess, say, uh, compel me to immediately look for more of it. Um, but, but I did listen to it like repeatedly over and over for like, you know, probably a couple of years. Wow. Uh, and I'm trying. I don't remember what it was that, that kind of like, like, you know, inspired me to start looking into uh, more noise. Uh, I just, I remember at some point I went to the same shop and was, you know, asking for some recommendations and they kind of like, Oh, you know, here, check out this MERS bow. And it was like, it was early stuff, like, yeah. like lowest arts and music, like the first tape. And that, I did not like that at all. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of like, fuck. Uh, so I tried a bit. And, and what, re- what really got me into it was the uh, control bleeding phlegm bag spattered. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, I think a collection, like a comp collection yeah. of uh, their material. And that's, that's when it clicked. Mm-hmm. That's when I was like, you know, yeah, I love this shit. Yeah. And, and started looking for more of it. And, um, of course to control bleeding, um, you know, that that's, that's like a mixed bag. Yeah, for sure. You, you mo- most of their stuff from, uh, that dates back to the, you know, period of the eighties is mostly noise, but then you get into sort of like, you know, more, I guess, Prague inspired stuff and, and sure. uh, but their early noise stuff i mean early, like knees and bones and whatever like those records are very early and they are very 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 harsh noise i mean i don't know what the i don't know yeah. what the trajectory is or you know how they relate to whatever else is going on but to me that doesn't often get mentioned that has to be some of the first really really harsh noise oh. even though it was still kind of under industry it was still like before that that style had really cemented itself but it's like pretty high five, maybe not high five, but it has pretty strong production values and it's mm-hmm. harsh as fuck and really violent. Like yeah. distortion, <laughs> screaming, metal banging. Like it's really, really harsh noise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and of course, and then from, um, there was, it was just a, this, you know, it was during that period of time where, you know, most places would let you preview, you know, even new import CDs, yeah. which, I missed that. Uh, but, you know, I'd listen to, listen to like tons of, of, of CDs and that, that's what kind of got me into uh, the uh, Japanese uh, mm-hmm. noise acts that, you know, gave Murrisbow a second shot. And I'm not sure what it was. It may have been um, uh, Great American Nude, Crash for Hi-Fi and maybe rainbow electronics uh, that that got me into a a lot of the Japanese stuff. Yeah. Cool. So when did you then start 
your project TF, when you start making noise, Scream and Writhe and Disaster Sources present Initial Shock, Montreal's Noise Fest, taking place from 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. Saturday, July 1st, 2023, at La Soterrania. The fest features Evic Shen, Neural, Shredded Nerve, Form Hunter, Jute, BP, Toanch Dwelling, Shameful, Skin Tone, En Regard Froid, Reaching Needles, Axiom, Orchid Lodge, MS, and Alter Boa. Tickets are $30 at the door. Advanced tickets are available at initialshock.screamandwrithe.com. All advanced tickets include an entry into a raffle draw to win one of several prizes at the night of the fest, plus a Scream and Writhe tote bag. Initial Shock is sponsored by Cheap Thrills, Montreal's longest-running cult record store, Pizza Bouquet, Montreal's finest DIY pizza joint, and Untitled Zine, a Canadian publication of forward-thinking sound and aesthetics. Come to Montreal on July 1st for a big day of noise, highlighting some of the best established and up-and-coming acts from Canada and the USA. Part of that impetus was like, okay, I was really into like, you know, the noisier control bleeding, uh, uh, certain Japanese artists, and I'm looking for more of it. And there wasn't a lot out there. It's, it's like after, you know, a couple of dozen albums, kind of like, you know, this was before, you know, the internet, you, right. you're basically kind of like, you know, limited to physical media and what, what's available in your area. Right. Uh, I mean, I did do some mail order from uh, relapse at the time. So, so uh, mm-hmm. I, I did get a lot of, you know, a few of the old pain jerk uh, cassettes. Yeah. Nice. Um, but yeah, a certain point where, you know, I, I, I kind of felt like I, I wasn't finding anything new that was like you know appealing to me and at a certain point i just decided you know uh i was you know i'll just do it myself cool <laughs> but you were like I, I i'll do pain jerk or i'll yeah, you know I'll, I'll have a shot at that i'll just i'll just do my own noise i mean yeah other people are doing it and, and i i had um uh, I mean, I'd already kind of like, like been involved with, you know, a local garage band. So I kind of had, had like some experience with music and, and equipment. Although at the time I didn't have anything I, I'd sold. I played guitar and I had sold that and, and my amps. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I got back into it. I ended up getting a, a flanger pedal at, at a pawn shop and then with a, a little like cheap crappy uh, microphone for like a boom box little plastic thing and plugged it into the boom box and uh that's pretty much how i started and then i just started buying more gear this this is is it this is it oh cool that's it uh, this is my fir- this is my first piece of noise gear that's killer yeah that's cool you've uh, this is a, what is an ibanez it looks like or i can't really um is digital flanger yeah nice no it's cool you mentioned that because uh yeah david kowalski uh asked through the patreon he also does purges i don't know if you're familiar with the yeah, project yeah. um he asked you know what he wanted to know what your first piece of noise gear was so i was actually just about to ask you that it is. <laughs> that's awesome um he also asked how old were you when you started making noise what age were you uh 24 mm-hmm. okay cool uh, so in a, in a kind of a late bloomer in a way Sure. I guess because it seems a lot of people tend to get into it in their teens. But like I said before, you know, where I live, I wasn't exposed to too much uh, interesting music until I, you know, started, you know, I, I kind of got out of town and started going to college. Yeah. And you know, meeting other people. For sure. So then with TF, um, I've noticed you worked with a lot of a handful of labels. I mean, mm-hmm. throughout throughout the years, you also were releasing music under your own imprint. I think earlier on, which was also TEF. Um, yeah. But I've but I've noticed you have a kind of a relationship. It seems or consistency with three labels. Um, that would be probably Hospital, 
pitch phase and data drumming that have kind of been there. You've been, you seem to be working pretty consistently with them throughout the years on and off, but can you talk about those three labels and their importance to you or how, how your relationship with them? Five new releases, four reissues, and two mixtapes will be available from Reanimated Miscarriage on June 23rd, featuring fresh material by Antipyrian Diverticulum, Gastric Mucosa, and Technocadaver, as well as discography releases and restocks from Anal Birth, Crematory Penis, Penis Geyser, Scab Addict, and Violent Shit. Early access is guaranteed by joining Reanimated Miscarriage's mailing list by writing to disease of the spirit at gmail.com otherwise everything listed and more will be available at trauma team online.net uh well hospital um i mean uh dominic uh richard and, and i had the three-way split back right. in how long ago was that was that oh one or oh two thousand one Magnified healing, right? Yeah. Right healing, yeah. Uh, that that would end up being like uh, Dom and I basically paid, you know, to have those five. I think it was like five hundred copies pressed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, I mean, I, I really haven't, other than that. And okay, he he also released the uh, the uh, split tape of mine with Horde Butcher, right? And, and I think that was around that same period. Yeah. Uh, and then recently, there there was the uh, tape he did in twenty twenty one. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, from that, you that often, but it's kind of like it seems kind of like in the early days, earlier days, you kind of had a some sort of working relationship, and then you know the fact that he released a a TF tape just a few a couple of years ago. I just kind mm-hmm. of and, and and that magnified healing release is is pretty iconic, and I was going to ask you about that too. I mean, can you talk about how that release came about? Working with Hospital, working with Richard, and and that whole time, how you guys connected and and decided to do this together. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd known Richard uh, since, like, 95, I believe, mm-hmm. uh, which, sh- like, shortly after I, I started doing my own noise. Uh, and it, I don't remember specifics, really, be- from that time, because it's been so long. Sure. I may have uh, been looking through through one of the two... Uh, free Houston area, you know, underground newspapers at the time. And, uh, I, I may, may have recognized the name black leather Jesus say from the, uh, Japanese American noise treaty. Mm. And, um, you know, I ended up going to that show and had like brought a tape with me, but just some, stuff I'd recorded and gave it, mm-hmm. gave it to Richard. And, um, you know, that, that's how we connected. Um, so, uh, and he, it's more than, more than likely as far as like, uh, you know, the connection with hospital was through him. Magnified healing. Um, did you guys kind of work on that as, some, was there some sort of like collaboration or talking about how it's going to go together? Or was it kind of just like, hey, we all have some tracks, let's put them together? You know, um, was Dominic kind of the one curating that, or 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 how did that how did that split? And because it's also kind of an odd, not an odd pairing, but it's quite a, a juxtaposed pairing of these three projects. Yeah, um, I mean, I honestly don't remember that made details from, sure. from uh, um, I mean, I, th- we, I believe we had all kind of like communicated about doing it, 
you know, beforehand. It, it wasn't like, oh, we just have tracks laying around. Let, let's do a release because I, I specifically recorded uh, my pieces for the that release. Mm-hmm. Cool. What about pitch phase? Uh, yes, Carlos Pozo. Uh, he's here in Houston. Mm-hmm. I'd. You know, just from doing shows, he he was he he had come to a lot, a lot of shows, and uh, that's where I met him. And you know, we he had his label, and um, you know, he asked for. I'm sure at some point he asked to do a release, and you know, I was like, sure, recorded material and uh, shorter releases, right? I mean, corrugation how, was corrugation a. A corrugation was like a full length, right? Kind of, yeah. For, corrugation was a full length. It's it's like roughly 29, 30 minutes long. Yeah. But I, I've always kind of felt with, uh, you know, sort of more cut up stuff. I, I always like that length. Yeah, for sure. Uh, roughly, you know, 30 to 40 minutes or so. Yeah. Kind of, kind of wears that out. Your, wears, wears out your welcome, you know. Beyond, much beyond that yeah a lot of me a lot of music does i think too i think that's a really good album good length for an album in general um and then nowadays i mean consistently throughout the years but particularly in the past 10 15 20 years you've you've worked very closely with data drumming yeah um, I remember hearing first year album Consequences and Conversation in 2010, I believe. That was the first exposure I had to you back then, and that blew me away. And then there was a lot of there was long silence from you. And then 2019, you came back with Framework on Dada Drumming. And then you also just last year released an album called Rot, also on Dada Drumming. Yeah. Tell me about your relationship with Greg and working with Dada Drumming and, and how that's been over the years. Oh yeah. Um, so, so yeah, Greg, uh, I mean, he's been part of the Texas noise scene since like the early two thousands. Mm-hmm. I, I know we, we've done, we had done like, I don't know how many different shows together, um, uh, playing Houston and Denton. Um, mm-hmm. I know, I think he's also done, done a few Austin shows as well. Uh, Back at you know, back at it, uh, earlier this century. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm trying to uh, again. It's like you know, the, the, these are sort of things where it's like you you already kind of know someone who yeah. you know also um, does noise, and then they happen to have a label, and then at a certain point. Uh, you know, they, they like respect your work and they ask to release something. Yeah, for sure. What is it about working with Greg though? That, that is so, I mean, you, that, that you've kind of maintained this, this close relationship with him and his label. Well, I mean, because I've, I've known, known him for a while. Um, it's like, and, and he, he's, he always asks me for, for, you know, for more material all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, he, he, so he, likes kind of, he kind of pushes you to, to, to produce. Yeah. In, in, in a way. And, uh, I mean, and, and he, he takes, I mean, he kind of like takes care of his artists as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he, he makes sure people, you know, people who've released stuff for him, you know, get paid. You know, I, I just got a, a check from him last week for like, you know, streaming, nice. streaming. Movies. So, you know, it's, it, I wasn't expecting it. It's, it's been a while, but you know, it's like, Hey, every little bit helps. All right. So for the Patreon content with this episode, Kevin has very graciously shared the audio from his 2002 release machination of a corner release as a biz card on pack rec, the tronic sub label. It's a killer five minute, 21 second track from TF, very rare. And it's up now to download for all Maniac Circle supporters of the podcast. 
For those who are supporting at the heavy sponsor and noise fiend level, I'm giving away one copy of the TEF A Fail Association split 7-inch that I released on White Centipede Noise in 2019. And this is the inverted color scheme copy. Tommy Carlson Rizzo printed all of the 7 inches. Um, we did this inverted color scheme for the test presses. So basically this is one of one. There are five others that went in the uh, crazy test pressing packaging we did. Um, so it's an inversion of this, which is the standard version. So once again, for all of those who support the podcast at the heavy sponsor and noise fiend level, I'm giving away this one seven inch at the end of the episode. There will be a post on Patreon. Be the first to comment on the post and you will receive the seven inch shipped to you in the mail. That's at patreon.com slash white centipede noise. All maniac circle supporters will have access to download the machination of a corner audio the pack rec biz card and there will be exclusive extended content available of this episode for the wcn tv supporters i'll tell you about that at the end of this episode now back to kevin is loyalty important to you in in working relationships you know your loyalty to a label or another artist or a friend or their theirs to you do you does that kind of feel like an important aspect of who you choose to work with and how I mean, I, I'm sure that's part of it. It's, it's not something I, I consciously think about. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it's like I've I've worked with Greg, you know, a number of times. I mean, other than the uh, three CDs, he, you know, we've done uh, some tapes. There's the split tape with scathing he, he did. Then I've done like, you know, a couple of collaborative tapes with him as well. And there's supposed to be a like a compilation coming out at some point soon cool I, I don't i don't know the like time frame on that but he's had my track for like two years already okay <laughs> he's always got something going on it seems like yeah, I, I, i'm not in a hurry yeah. all, all I, is i'm done with that yeah yeah cool um but, yeah, i mean t He's a great guy, and like I said, he 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 does all he can to su support, you know, the noise scene and especially Texas yeah. noise in particular. Yeah, for sure. That's, and definitely, I definitely appreciate all he's done. Yeah, that comes through. I mean, I I've always noticed that just from his label, and especially you know, especially after inter you know talking with him through emails and interviewing him, I really respect the way he the way he respects artists and takes care of them and, and respects the, the duties that a label should have, you know, he takes it very seriously. And that's very, that's very cool. So let's talk then, I guess, more about your work as TEF. I always think of it as like the pinnacle of cut up harsh noise. It's like, so, I mean, I don't listen to a ton of various harsh cut up artists. Like that's not always what I'm into, but if I'm going to grab some cut up stuff, I'm going to go for yours because it's it t it it ticks all those boxes and it hits that perfectly. Can you tell me just about kind of your 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 process, your technical process, how you get to those such complex dynamic fast pieces from, you know, starting at your gear, starting the source to what it ends up on the rec recording? Are you are you are you recording the stuff live? Are you doing a lot of post-production editing like how, how much of that or how does how does that work how does how does the track come from the beginning to the end uh well yeah obvious obviously as most people w w you know will know it's it's not like all live yeah uh, what what i've done since like around 2002 or so is i i use a uh korg d1200 a digital multi-track recorder mm -hmm. most of these most of the pieces are usually like utilizing four tracks and um i know a, a lot of people who do cut up will just record a, a bunch of source material and then kind of assemble it after the fact mm -hmm. what i tend to do with this is record like a, a you know a certain amount 
and then like just stop and then record something else mm-hmm. immediately after that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, um, so, so, the, yeah. so the bursts are so like a, a, a linear part of a, of a recording, like say like 10 seconds or 15 seconds is a live. Yeah. Take, yeah. And then, and then it just cuts to another one that's also played live. So you're not, but are you also multi-tracking on top of each other? Oh uh, yeah. I'll, I'll go back and, and like, you know, I might record, you know, the first segment on, on, you know, the first track and then record a bit on the second. And, uh, it, it, uh, it, it progresses in a linear fashion. And, and then I, I'll listen to that and go back and, you know, make little, you know, edits and cut stuff out that just isn't working for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's probably like a, a more tedious process than, than most other people, uh, you know, utilized, like say using software. So you're doing uh, this all, all without software. You're doing this all on the, the, the hardware. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, there, there were like two tracks on rot that, that I put together on the, com- you know, in the computer because it ended up kind of being faster for me mm-hmm. uh, because I was able to, to use uh, some, the, there's a lot of like older material source stuff that, that I could just pick from yeah. uh, the, the assembling it on, on, on the, D1200 is like I said, there's a lot. I can't tell you how much I've recorded that has been just deleted. Yeah. You know, because it's like, oh, well, th- this doesn't work. So I just, you know, delete this one track and, and yeah. then st- and it's know. gone forever. Yeah, it's gone forever. That's crazy. Does the D1200 have a, have, what kind of interface does it have? Does it have a pretty visual interface? Uh, it works for me because, um, you know, I start, okay. Um, trying, trying to think, um, okay. The harsh noise CD, the, the TEF CD uh, on the harsh noise label. Yeah. Uh, that's actually, that was actually recorded on four track tape. Wow. Uh, same with, uh, schizoid, the, the, uh, three-way split with with myself uh facial mess and sickness oh the, those those tracks were that was done on like a, a yamaha um uh, uh cassette multi-track with one bad channel so it's really just it's it's three track that's awesome yeah so the i ended up get i got the d1200 because it, it the the uh the visual interface is just some, it, it kind of corresponds to what I was uh, familiar with working with like four track cassette prior to that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it just, it allowed me to kind of like be more precise with the, uh, the edits. Yeah. Crazy though. That seems so difficult. Does it, does it, does it show like, a, does it show waveforms that you can, uh, I'm, I've, I'm sure it does. I've never like, gotten into those screens okay so you're going off of like you're editing purely with your ear uh i mean there there is like a a little uh graphic that that i can kind of like uh see uh where where each track is and with like the bits and pieces that i have you know, recorded where they are. So I, I, mm-hmm. I can like mark certain, like different parts to go back to and, and uh, you know, rework it if I, if I need to. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 of course that era might be over with because I have two of them and both of them, the, the screens are like, you know, completely fucked. Okay. <laughs> uh, like they're, they're, they're what they've just whited out altogether. Sure. I, I can't see anything on them. Could you see yourself like applying that kind of stuff you do and like, say like learning Ableton or you're using Ableton, I mean, using Ableton or some of those more modern 
DAW softwares where you could really do what you do and then really focus in on it and really, you know, push things around and, 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 and place them however you want? Is that something you would have interest in doing or, or, or do already maybe on some level? Uh, well, I mean, the, the last two tracks I, I put together for Rot, I just, I used Audacity. Okay. So. That's so crazy. Audacity is like so prevalent in, in, in noise. And I think when I hear your work, it's so, it's so technical and precise. I think God, he must be, he must be using like, you know, Pro Tools or Ableton very, very proficiently, but I feel like no. a lot of a lot of no, a lot of really noise artists they don't, and then when they do use a a DAW, they use Audacity, which is like one of the most basic. Yeah, ones. I mean, <laughs> I don't feel it. I mean, it's like uh, I think people have mentioned, you know, you should use you know this or that, and I'm like, there's too much in there. I don't need all that extra. Yeah. You know, You're really I, playing a lot of that stuff live. I mean, like that. I saw you play. I, I saw you play in Houston uh, once, probably 10, 15 years ago. And I'm yeah, sorry, you, if that sucked. No, it didn't suck. It was it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. And you had a table full of gear, and it sounded very, very close to what your recordings sound like. So that was like that blew my mind because like, oh shit! I always kind of thought cut up people are doing that they're just, they're just kind of like doing one ch channel kind of track like a bunch of different recording a source and then and then going in and, and chopping it up in a computer and placing it and composing it like that but it was like clear that you're playing this cut up live mm -hmm. also yeah well it's live is pretty much just an approximation uh, of you know what i'm doing in the studio yeah but I'm talking I mean, live in the studio. You're still, you know, when you're recording a take, you're you're performing it in a very cut up way already. Mm -hmm. Which is, I don't know. I think that's amazing. I don't know. I don't know how people do that. I don't know, I don't know how you do that. Yeah, I, I always think I could do it better live. I mean, not not that not that I am doing. I could always stand to do it better in a live situation. Sure. Well, then you get the chance to. To edit it so but how how did you develop this the skill for playing it because i mean when i when and when i talk about live i don't necessarily mean live at a concert but like when you record in the studio even like a take how did you develop that craft to record a live take that's like you know cutting up like crazy oh. with a lot of you know and not just randomly it's not just like there's some like stuff bumping around because when i've tried sort of cut up stuff and you know i hit all these dead spots i'm like oh that's that wasn't supposed to happen that sucks that's sucks. it's like how did you develop that skill oh uh, damn all right Which, uh well like say re recording parts here here at home uh a, a lot of it is like kind of like pre-recording prep, mm -hmm. right? Like I, I'll actually play around uh, uh, with the gear until I actually, until I get something I like before I record it. Yeah. So, so e like I said, there's, there's a lot of stuff that I've recorded that is ended up deleted forever. There, there's a lot of stuff that I never record. Right. As well. So, uh, how As often far, are you practicing or working on stuff? I mean, like, how often are you just going to your gear and just turning it on and, and, and working stuff out? Uh, I mean, I actually go for long periods where I don't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, okay, occasionally, like right now, I ha have, you know, a, a bit of gear set up in, in front of the computer that, that I'm, you know, I'll play around with. Uh, um. So, so that's something I, I'll usually do if, if I'm not, even if I'm not touching my, my main setup for, mm -hmm. for recording. Because uh, sometimes I, I'll, you know, run across like a combination of, uh, of, you know, pedals and maybe a synth or some other sound source that, that works, you know, works really well together. And uh, I'll just like 
record um, some of that onto mini disc. Mm-hmm. So I've, been, I've also been working with mini disc since like the nineties. Mm. Um, ju- just so I, I have that available and, and you know, I, I'll sometimes use that in, in recordings as well. Yeah. Nice. What are some of your key pieces of gear beyond the recording equipment, but like in terms of your, your sound? Hmm. Uh, looking over here. Uh, well, uh, one particular thing that, that I've used in, in you know, consistently since it first came out was the uh, Korg Chaos Pad. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I only really use the looping effects. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, that I've I've never really, sometimes I've used like uh, some of the filters on them before, but, you know, I specifically use them for, for looping and kind of getting like that. If you, you can also get kind of like cut up, you know, uh, just by tapping on the pad mm-hmm. and, and, you know, quickly holding down a little bit in, you know, various uh, locations. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, ever since the first one came out, I've, I've had like, the the original the the second one the the kp3 and uh at one time i had three of the uh mini chaos pads as well cool cool you're able to kind of grab like a loop right you can like be playing source and you can kind of just like grab yeah yeah grab them were, and like loop them quick right mm-hmm. yeah it's it's just really convenient and uh, you know for for creating kind of like quick loops on the fly. Nice. Yeah. It um, is a very, I've never played with them, but it seems like a very actually intuitive and, and, and perfectly designed kind of piece of gear for what a lot of noise artists want to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, yeah, I know, I know a lot of people have used them. Uh, you don't see them all that often these days uh, just because I don't know that they're really making them anymore. Mm. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, another another piece has been kind of consistent uh, for like maybe the last twenty years has been the last gasp uh, cyber psychic parametric oscillofilter. filter, mm-hmm. and, and I specifically use that for the you know filter. I don't don't really you know. Uh, adjust it to where it self oscillates or anything. Um, but yeah, I've, I'm kind of particular about filters and, and I just, I really like that one. I've tried a lot of different ones. Uh, so, so there's the LAL, uh, uh, you know, cyber psychic. Uh, then I have, uh, a rack piece, which say, uh, it's a, a clone of the uh, EDP wasp filter. Mm, cool. Um, and th- this w- this was made back in the '90s. Originally, it was like MAM uh, Music and More, mm-hmm. but this is some, like it's Terratech producer mm-hmm. Sign Warp Nine. I, I I'd been looking for for you know the the MAM. Uh, warp nine filter for a while uh and this was like early 2000s and then i just happened to, uh, across this one like small um uh, uh shop out in la happened to have this which was the same thing cool. and i think it was the last one they had nice. it's been with you ever since yeah, yeah, I've I've held on to that one. Uh pretty key part of your sound. Uh I mean I wouldn't necessarily say it's a, a key part uh, of the sound. It's just it's a filter I really like. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you talk can you try at least to talk a little bit about your kind of your ear and and 
an intent when what's guiding you when you're putting these 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 tracks together like you know they're very they're very musical but not in an unexpected kind of musical way but they're very like the sound is very very intentional and cinematic composed yeah composed but not but not even like when i say composed when i think of composed sometimes it gives like almost a overly contrived sense but your pieces have still a lot of really they're really chaotic but still very intentional what what what's going on in your ear what are you what are you trying to achieve with them how do you how do you think about the sound i mean it's something I, I've thought about numerous times, and I've re- it's really kind of hard to explain. I hear such flow and tension and dynamic and composition, but not really always in the most expected way. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, it's still happening in a surprising way, and that's mm-hmm. that's what I think sets it apart. I think from a lot of other cut up stuff or kind of more composed noise where. You can kind of go, okay, now there's a build up and now there's a crazy part. Now there's a drop. I mean, there's in your work, there's a lot of surprise, you know, there, there's like, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's almost like, like, uh, a, a, a lot, a lot of cut up ha, has a, you know, there's a certain formula that's, that's expected for, for a, a lot of cut up noise. And I, I mean, I've never really been interested in like adhering to, you know, uh, you know, what, what's expected yeah, uh, with, with what I'm doing. It's like, I, I'm stories like, you know, how, uh, how are, how are these two sounds go, going to sound together? You know, mm-hmm. uh, I, I guess in, in a lot of ways, I, I've always like, um, it, even though I guess I know what I'm doing, I, 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 a lot of times I, it's unexpected and I, I don't know how things are going to turn out. Yeah. You know, I, I like to say, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. It's like, yeah. because I, I don't really have a, a, you know, any sort of like plan of how a track is going to uh, turn out mm-hmm. from, from, you know, from the start. It's like I start recording and it, you know, the, the tracks themselves, you know, kind of like, you know, they, they unfold. Yeah. Do you like leaving things to chance in some way? Do you like to let that be an element? Uh. I guess because it's it's like that's that's where you have like, like I guess interesting juxtapositions uh, right. of sound, you know. Um, you can kind of throw the sticks and let them fall, and then sometimes like that. Yeah, that, like uh, I'll re- record a bit, and then may just be like, uh, won't touch it, the recording again for uh, a few days, and then come back to it and start playing with with. Uh, you know, playing something and it'll be like, well, let's see how this sounds together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, in a lot of ways, it, it really is kind of like just experimenting to, to see whether or not it works. So you're not going in with like a, a chart or a structured plan. Okay. I want, I want to do this. And there, there, there's usually no preconceived notion. So sometimes, you know, as a piece progresses, I, I kind of, get a feeling for when uh you know say say a dropout or quieter you know part you know is coming yeah you know it's it's just a matter of getting there do you ever you know you mentioned the formula and the kind of expected patterns and wanting to deviate from that from that do you, or, or to not follow that, do you ever find yourself like in composing or in playing, like going towards something that you maybe feel is kind of musical or formulaic and then like intentionally being like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to stop myself from doing that. Mm. Again, pr- probably not really consciously. Mm-hmm. Um, just like say I, but you know by the, by the time i finish with, with a track i don't want to listen to it again because i i've 
I've listened to it so many times. Quick editor's note here. After our interview, Kevin joined on to the White Centipede Noise Discord server and added some really interesting details that he didn't mention here about his recording process, which I will share here. He said, I could cite a number of other artists across a range of musical styles as influences, but I think what really led to me developing my particular style was often being inspired to record five or ten minutes before leaving for work in the evening back in the late 90s. I'd sometimes only get a few seconds recorded before I absolutely had to be out the door, then recorded a bit more in the morning before going to bed. Recording to four-track cassette, I'd pick up where I left off, but on a different channel, and slightly before where I stopped the previous session, in order to minimize and mask the usual tape mechanism noises and dropouts typical of recording from the end of an audio track. At a certain point, I realized that method could be used to cut between disparate sounds rather than as a way to splice similar audio together. When it comes back from the plant and, it's, and the label delivers it to you, here's your album, Do you, will you th- kind of enjoy throwing it on from time to time and listening to it or uh maybe not immediately i might listen to it like like when i first get it mm-hmm. uh ju- just for like you know okay it's completed yeah. the, the process is done and then usually I'll, I'll go a few years before i listen to it again yeah the new album rot it follows your your trajectory quite closely and logically. Um, one thing, though, I've noticed is that a lot of your albums have no track titles, and the, the information and the, the imagery is usually quite sparse and stoic. I mean, usually the title gives some sort of hint of some sort of idea or emotion. I mean, Consequences in Conversation is it's quite low. That, that's a title with quite emotional loading but then there's no track titles no additional information so usually we get just the album title and that's kind of it um mm. framework uh, is also a very very kind of sparse album i mean the, art, the artwork the, even the title framework is like and it's then just so like but but rot has the track titles are numbers mm-hmm. what is and i get the sense that's that, that i feel like it's sort of a personal album in some uh, I mean, actually, the numbers thing was Greg's idea. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't something I, I thought of. Uh, I, I mean, the truth is, with, with titles, I am awful with titles. It takes uh, – part, part of the reason I don't title tracks is because it usually takes me so long to come up with a title for, for the album itself. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh you know, I've, I've finished these pieces and, and I have this collection of sounds and noises. And it's, uh, I kind of end up having to, to digest that. And, and you know, I, I have to come up with a title. And, and, and that, that in and of itself is kind of like, like a process of, uh, that, that takes a while. So it's like, can you describe that process? How you how you arrive at a title of an album? Uh, it's it's kind of it's kind of like you know what ends up. You see, you, you see ha- having to describe how I get to a title is almost as excruciating as coming up. <laughs> well, you don't have to then, but I, I, I yeah. Then that's then that's then that says. And that says it all, I guess. That says that says. <laughs> um, what do you think in general about the the relationship between noise and imagery and content? Is there is there what's the relationship there for you and your work? And like, is there an inherent relationship between that? Is can, can noise be just noise, or are you are you trying to to do you feel like you're trying to convey emotions or tell a story with the noise or, or. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm my, my main focus is, is on the sounds them, themselves. Like I know a lot of people t- tend to have like, like, you know, a, a definite, you know, Con, you know, conceptual idea behind behind their noise when when they before they even start, mm-hmm. you know, start with 
the idea. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm really more about just like, you know, the sounds themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I, then afterwards I kind of have to work out, uh, you know, what, what sort of impression, you know, I, I get from this collection of sounds. And, and, and you know, um, I've, I mean, I thought about go, trying to go at it the other way around, but the, then I, I also feel like I'm kind of like, uh, uh, I guess, limiting myself to a, you know, a certain like concept and that, that, that could yeah. also kind of like limit, um, how I, I approach recording and, and you know the the sounds that, that I make that they have to fit into a, a certain uh, framework for this you know a, a pre you know preconceived concept. Yeah. Do you feel like when you're working on an album that you're processing something for yourself, like internally in some way? Oh yeah, de definitely. There, there's there's always that aspect going on. Uh, I, yeah. Um, what does it feel like to be working on an album? Like, what does it feel like when you're when you're locked in and and, and making putting those those albums those, those pieces together and working on it so hard? I don't know. Just, I mean, it's it's just it's great when the things are are like really you know coming together and then there are times where it's like i just hit like a wall and it's just nothing but total frustration mm -hmm. so so yeah as as far as le, like uh you know ha, you know emotionally it's it's like one extreme to another mm -hmm. and when you're when i when i ask about you know are you processing something are you do you feel like you're processing things from your from your daily life from your personal life that are kind of being channeled into this sound work. Yeah, uh, definitely. But you know, I I'm not going to get into to you know, like my personal issues. Sure. But do you think it's do you think it's it's beneficial? Do you think it's helpful? Uh, as as far as like being like like a a, a sort of it's like being therapeutic. For example, or, or, you know, or just, just that it, yeah, helps with whatever one is going through or, or dealing with or processing is that it has a positive effect on, on that at least personal feeling with, with whatever subject it is. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's definitely an outlet for, for me, uh, at, so, something I, I've always, you know, as, as as long as I can remember, I've I've always had like some sort of need for a uh, creative outlet, mm -hmm. uh, and, and noise definitely fills uh, uh, fills that need for me. I do occasionally paint. I haven't done it in a while, but that that's also been like. You know, visual art uh, has also been something I, I've been interested in, and and I kind of, uh, especially back in the '90s, uh, kind of like went between the the two as far as like music and, and visual art. Cool. I did not know that. Yeah. Um, there was a long break between consequences and conversation, which. I believe it came out in 2010 and framework mm -hmm. 2019. And, and besides maybe a split or two that I think came out in between. And, and them. There probably like some comp tracks as well. Right. But no, no, full, no full album. And both those albums feel like statements. And why was there such a long pause between that? And, you know, if, if noise is something that you, that is very important for you to kind of just have an outlet for, did you have an outlet during that time? Uh, I mean, you know, I've, I'm still, you know, I'm still doing noise. Uh, I'm, I know there was, uh, 
you know, doing live shows mm -hmm. as well. Uh, that that kind of kind of you know fills that niche. Yeah. Um, you know, I I don't actually. It's it's it takes me a long time to kind of finish uh, recording full albums. Like, uh, but between framework and rot, that was like three years. Yeah, but yeah. That's, that in 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 TEF uh, in TEF years that felt that felt soon. I was I was stoked because I've been still I've been still getting so much out of framework. I mean, I listen to that very frequently, and I'm always I keep restocking that in the shop, and I'm always like pushing that on people. And mm -hmm. so, framework to me was like really one of my favorite favorite albums of the past several years. So when a new one came, I was like, what? There's a new one already? Yeah, it was awesome. But before that, it was like consequences and conversation. Was, there was such a long pause. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what the reason for that was. It's it's just, it's so, it's, it's just how it goes. Yeah. No, uh, sure. I'm not always inspired to actually, it, it's really, sometimes it's really difficult for me to, to get inspiration. Yeah you know to to focus on on doing a, a full album yeah um what gives you inspiration <laughs> oh <laughs> that's that's hard to answer no yeah. um i mean it, it kind of comes uh, uh, from like it's internal, yeah. You know, um, as, as far as let, let you know, uh, say say I guess motivation would be a, a better word for it, sure. Because uh, yeah, it's 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 often really hard to get motivated, and that really just comes it you know from an internal place does an outside source like for example greg being like hey man i want you to make a new album make a new album does that play a role i mean i kind of assume he must have been pecking at you those entire well, yeah he he was <laughs> i mean since consequence this conversation i'm sure he was like trying to pump you up to to produce something well, I mean, new greg had kind of walked out of the, the scene during that time as well that's true you know, yeah he, i mean you know, he, he did the interview with you and he, he kind of, he had like a, a long, you know, absence as well, uh, with, with, you know, just life in general uh, happening. So, so that's, that's part of the reason. It's like, um, it's like, like there, there'll be, there'll be periods of time where I get like, uh, offers from people to to do albums like i may get three or four within a few months of each other but, uh, it's usually when i'm working on something else so so then by the time i finish what i'm working on uh i don't hear from from those people again so so it's, you know just just how things work out um uh, because uh, I know Greg has already mentioned, uh, you know, the next album. Yeah. Um, which, which I'm not. I'm not sure what sort of time frame he's looking at for for that. Are you working um, on something already? I'm not. Okay. <laughs> I mean, so, since finishing Rot, I've I haven't recorded anything. Yeah. Uh, understandable i mean those albums are very it sound very very labor intensive yeah they kind of are and and, and after finishing uh it, it, it's it, it's kind of draining yeah it, it's it's like it, it, it's kind of a relief to be done and, and just kind of you know have, have a rest of course the danger there is that you know i, I get used to having the rest sure. uh, but it's an but, important part of the cycle. But, but, but there is at least one one track from uh, the uh, 
sessions for for rot that is done and ready to like go on on the next album. Nice. Um, I, I mean, actually, that that came about because uh, originally there was supposed to be like a a limited uh, vinyl pressing. Right. Greg mentioned that to me. Yeah, and uh, that just got totally fucked up, and, and there was like going to be a. It, it was going to be like a, a completely different track listing, and yeah. there were two pieces that weren't on the vinyl that were on the LP, but then there was going to be like an LP exclusive track, and right. so that's that's the one that's kind of waiting for me to to start uh, recording some new material for the next album. Mm-hmm. Cool, that's great. Um, David Kowalski had another question, um, mm-hmm. and this is very open, but it's a very interesting question to me. What aspect of noise do you value the most? I mean, I, I, I guess it, in a way it's kind of cliched, I guess the catharsis, the, the, the release mm-hmm. that, that it allows you. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's kind of like a standard answer that most people give. No, it's not. It's really not. Some people say some people, people say the opposite. I mean, people. Some people get that. I've heard people also say there's no, you know, there's no catharsis from noise. There's zero. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just, I, I love doing it. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I just, um, I. I just, I just love exploring sound. Fuck. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Do you ever see yourself getting kind of, sorry, go on. Oh, I was going to say, if if I didn't, I I, I wouldn't still be doing this after 28 years. Yeah, exactly. Do you ever see yourself like getting tired of the TEF approach and wanting to go in a totally different direction or, 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 you know, even not, even in a totally different direction, like totally kind of rehaul your process, your gear, anything like that. Does that ever come to you with that where you like feel like you're um, sick of sick to do it this way? Mm, no, I mean, I've, I've thought about, about that before, but it's like, uh, I just feel that, like, you know, this, this approach that it's really open to kind of like doing, you know, doing a, a, like a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a certain, you know, I guess I have my own sort of formula, but it's kind of in a way it's, it's open-ended. So I can, you know, uh, I mean, I couldn't really see myself doing wall noise. Of of course I'm, I'm, I'm involved with black leather Jesus. So, in a way, I, yeah. I do actually do wall noise, and, yeah. and that, uh, but but it's not really a, f- a focus. I'm I'm part of like you know a larger yeah. group, but I, I don't think I, I could like you know say myself you know do a solo wall noise project. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How how is playing in Black Leather Jesus versus what you do solo? Are you doing like your kind of methods in black leather Jesus or are you no no I, I'm I'm basically what what I'm doing is is pretty much you know like geared specifically for black leather Jesus. It's mm-hmm. more just like you know create a wall of sound. Mm-hmm. Uh you know I'm I'm not I, I mean it, it, in in a lot of ways it's kind of like uh, I don't have to you know there's a lot less pressure you know, most of the time I'm not going to be able to hear myself anyway. Right. Uh, right. So. There's it's, it's forgiving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. You, there's, a, there's a lot less pressure and, and, you know, uh, I, it's, I mean, I, I enjoy it. Uh, definitely. Uh, how long have you been a member? Since I think I want to say, since like around November of 96. 
mm-hmm. is when Richard asked me to to uh, you know join BLJ. So uh, as far as I know, uh, outside of Richard, I've been like the longest standing you know member of the group. Crazy. That's awesome. How many recordings have you been on roughly, would you say? Oh, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I haven't kept track. I, I mean, it, it, at least a dozen. Yeah. Or probably more. Yeah. Do you have any live events or shows coming up near soon, either either as a member of Black Lives Jesus or, or TEF? I've, I've been you know, discussing with several other Texas acts and we're currently in the process of putting together a Midwest East coast tour. Whoa. Uh, July. I, I refer to this as text fest. Yeah. That's a, that's a traveling text fest. That's a convoy. It, yeah. So <laughs> you you're gonna pro- probably each be driving your own like big pickup, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, but, but we probably will have one big pickup. <laughs> <laughs> I bet Greg drives a big pickup. He doesn't. Oh, okay. He does. He, Greg, Greg has a Mercedes. Is oh, it? Okay. That's no, very it's, Texan. Yeah. That's not very Texan. <laughs> he, he, he's a bougie. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Wow. That's, that sounds great. I mean, that's, that's what, that is a Texas fest. I mean, that's great. I mean, that's the kind of thing that people would have to normally go to Texas to see and you're bringing it to them. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're, are, some we're, of, are any of the dates confirmed? Uh, not yet. Uh, Rob is going to be getting in contact with people, uh, as far as, you know, getting dates locked down, mm-hmm. uh, he's out of town at the moment, but we'll, we'll start reaching out to people next week. Nice. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm excited about this because this will actually be the first true multi-state TEF tour. Nice. Yeah, I mean I, I've played outside of Texas before, uh, but it's usually been like one-off festivals and shows. Yeah. The the only other thing that I I could count as a, a tour would have been uh, 2001 when Andy O'Sullivan. Uh, goat mm-hmm. and i went out to california and we did uh three shows out there nice but it was all in in california yeah well that's awesome because i mean i think the midwest has long been kind of in my opinion kind of the the breathing heart and lungs of a lot of the noise scene in the states like maybe not mm-hmm. as much i don't know if as much anymore but i mean you know, that's always been where a lot of fanatic shows go on, basement shows. But it also seems like right now the East Coast mm-hmm. in the yeah. past several years has also picked up really a lot. Whereas, you know, 10 or so years ago, it wasn't as much. But, I don't know, New York, Philly, mm-hmm. Pittsburgh, those are all areas where it seems to be a lot of really good live noise going on. So... That'll be great. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I mean, I did the East Coast tour with Black Leather Jesus back in 2020, and uh, oh yeah, that w- that was great. Uh, re- really enjoyed that, uh, and that was that's like the first time I'd been out to the East Coast since '91. Nice. So, but even before I, I was doing noise, yeah. Uh, and I, I've always loved it out there. Yeah, must have been a treat. I mean, traveling, traveling, doing noise, traveling, doing noise with, with friends, people you like is it's the best. You can't beat that. The following noise video is brought to you by the White Centipede Noise Maniac Circle. For information on the artist and track, check the description of this episode.
what are your top five noise releases of all time? Uh, yeah, I, I've been thinking about this, and it's like I I don't necessarily have like favorites of anything. I, what about I, five that have been like really important to you? Okay, five, five that have been really important to me. Well, I, I've already mentioned two. Like, like I guess uh, that'd be influential. Yeah. Uh, say haters in the shade of fire. Yeah. Is that but that was the first true noise album that I ever owned. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I still have that vinyl uh, after all these years. Nice. Um, and control bleeding, uh, phlegm bag spattered, mm -hmm. which is, like I said, what, what really made noise click for me. It's just, you know, started my uh, obsession with the genre. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, Probably, and I, I know I got to throw Murder's Bow album in there. Yeah. Um, and I mean, again, because there's there's so many different ones, but yeah, I guess, I guess uh, as far as, you know, being important, uh, influential for me, it would, it would have to be like Great American Nude, Crash for Hi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Or or Rainbow Electronics, because those were, were the two I kind of like roughly around the same time that yeah. that, that, that kind of like uh, got me into uh, Japanese noise. Yeah. Uh, and that, <clears throat> that uh, the self-titled Masana album mm -hmm. on Alchemy. I, I don't speak French, so I'm not going to try to break that down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and for a fifth, yeah, uh, I know a lot of people that, like doing these lists and they're all like f five, only five, and they'll, they'll yeah. give you like 500. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, there's, 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 there are like so many albums that, that I, I like. I just, I don't like ranking them. Yeah, you know? I understand. Do you listen to, I mean, I know you make noise like crazy. Do you listen to noise like super frequently and heavily? Uh, not as much as I used to. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's, that's something that, that, I mean, it's like, I don't really make a secret about that to a lot of people, but I think, uh, uh it would surprise a lot of people that I don't listen to, to that much noise. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, the, these days, um, uh, I think a lot of that too comes down from just like listening to my own stuff so much yeah. when I, you know, when I'm making it, uh, sure. when, when I, when I'm done, I just, I need a break. Yeah. I can understand that. Yeah. I can understand that for sure. Um, are there, are there any recent artists or albums of the past? I mean, not the past year or two, but just, you know, kind of more contemporary stuff that's come on the past several years doesn't need to be like a list or a ranked or anything like that, but any sort of like, like newer contemporary stuff that you're like, Oh, this is, this is pretty, this is pretty interesting to me. This anything that's caught your ear or that sticks out to you that you. Uh, I mean, mm, I, I'm, tr I'm trying to, to, to think of some names. I mean, uh, uh, a, a, a lot of what, what's kind of impressed me more, like I guess recently is just like doing live shows mm -hmm. and just like f fellow Texas artists, like, you know, scathing and yeah. total part. Uh, yeah. but both of them, you know, I highly recommended, uh, been, been very, you know, very impressed. And, uh, especially with like total sweetheart, their live performances, cool. you know, really good. Cool, man. Well, I really appreciate it. It was great to talk to you. Oh, yeah. And, I, I had fun. Yeah, excellent. Me too. And uh, really looking forward to the next TF album, however long that may take. I'm I'm still enjoying the last two very heavily. And uh, I'll be sure to keep restocking them. It won't be as long as between consequences and conversation and uh, framework. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Yeah. It's, it's more more like like a, a you know framework to rot. Yeah. Good. Great. 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 It's it's been, it's been less than a year now. You know. Yeah. Where, rot was very right. in October, so. Yeah. We're not even half a year out. Exactly, so. and you've already got the some of the seeds for the next one, so that's that's cool. Yeah. Um, hope the tour goes well. I'll be sure to let people know about that as well. And uh, anything else you want to tell the people? Uh, nah, I'm good. <laughs> okay. All right, Kevin. Thank you so much. And thank take you. Take care, and we'll talk to you soon. Head over to the Patreon now to check out the exclusive extended segments of this interview with Kevin Novak of TEF. He talks a bit about the brass tax of streaming revenue, his former label, special handmade packaging, and reissues. And as mentioned earlier in the episode, Maniac Circle supporters can download the audio for the TEF release, Machination of a Corner, released in 2002 as a biz card on PacRec. Also, if you're watching this live in a matter of minutes, there will be a post visible to all heavy sponsor and noise fiend supporters of the podcast. Be the first to comment on this post, and you will win this special edition TEF and a Fail Association split 7-inch with the one-of-a-kind inverted colorway Rizzo printed by Tommy Carlson. Go to patreon.com slash white centipede noise to see all that and more and support this show. I want to give a big, big thank you to all Patreon supporters of the podcast, past, present, and future. And at this time, I especially want to shout out those who have been supporting from early on since day one in those first couple months before I hit my stride, before I really started focusing on Patreon benefits and bonus content. I'm not going to list you because I don't know if people like that, but you know who you are. You really mean a lot to me, and I won't forget how you believed in what I was doing early on and showed that. Also, a huge thank you to everyone else who's joined on since then. Thank you for paying attention and acknowledging the work that goes into this podcast. It's because of you that I'm able to keep it up, and we'll be able to keep it up into the future. For those of you not supporting yet, head over to patreon.com slash white centipede noise now to check out the various levels of support and benefits available for doing so. I'm only doing public episodes of the podcast every other week from now on. So for just five euros a month through Patreon, you can get access to the full weekly schedule, which means new episodes, new content each week. The next level up from that for 10 euros a month is the Maniac Circle. I try to give regular digital downloads related to my guest. And through the Maniac Circle, you have opportunity to be more involved with the podcast, what goes into it, submitting material, submitting content, submitting ideas, asking questions for the guests, and getting behind the scenes info on the podcast and the label White Centipede Noise. The next level up from that is for heavy sponsors and noise fiends. If you support the podcast at 25 euros per month, you get everything in the previous tiers. You also get to partake in the physical merch giveaways and occasional gifts. You also get access to a private old school list of incoming distro items and new white centipede noise releases. And you'll have the chance to reserve and pre-order them before they hit the mail order for the general public. All of these things I offer are my way of thanking you for your crucial support of this podcast. I can't do it without your support, so I really appreciate those who recognize that and step up, and I do my best to thank them and make it worth their while. This is all just a rough rundown of what's going on on the Patreon, so head over to patreon.com slash white centipede noise now to check it all out and support this operation. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting. Until next time.